Please turn to the historical document that we refer to as the Gospel according to Luke. Luke 24. I'm going to be reading Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. And they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. Blessed is the testimony of Jesus' eyewitnesses communicated to his servant Luke, for us and for our salvation. Father, thank you. We love this day as your people around the world. So let us again relive it all, not merely intellectually, but spiritually with our hearts affected. And that's only going to happen because of your grace, of the presence, and the working of your Holy Spirit. And so, to that end, to your glory, we ask it. Amen. There are a lot of recorded histories of things throughout the centuries. But there is no documentation of any event in history that comes close to the importance of the historical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What I mean is, even right now, there there, there are billions upon billions of things that are true but they're just not that important. And there are other things that if they were true, that would be really important, but they're not true. And so what we have here is eyewitnesses who are testifying that Jesus from Nazareth, who was the promised Messiah in the Hebrew Scripture, or saying that He is Yahweh, God, who became a human being in order to die so that sinners could have all of their sins forgiven forever and enter into God's life, eternal life in the resurrection one day. But that wasn't just their testimony. They went on to say, three days after His death, that man was resurrected from the dead 
to human immortality. So the question is, is that true? Obviously, if that is true, that is by far the greatest possible news ever. But if it's not true, then it doesn't really matter how great that news is. We've all gotten the emails, haven't we? Right? Here you go. Open it up. Click on this thing here because you want a million dollars. Take the survey and you'll collect your money. That's great news. But hopefully none of you actually click on it. You just delete it because you know it's not true. So the question remains, is this what we celebrate throughout the world? We call it Easter. We call it Resurrection Sunday. Is it true? And so that turns us to the issue of the credibility of the witnesses and of the historical accounts. And so this particular historian, a physician by trade, he opens up his document this way. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also having followed all things closely for some time past to write an orderly account. So this issue of the truthfulness and the reliability of these eyewitnesses is crucial because Christianity is unique. It, it is it, it's very different than all the other major religions of the world. Because Christianity is not primarily a system of doctrines or moral codes for living a better life. Christianity is founded upon the seemingly ludicrous, the, the impossible proposition that Jesus, who was killed on a Roman cross, confirmed dead, rigor mortis setting in, getting cold and very cold by the time he's in the cave before sunset. It says, foundationally for Christianity, that dead man rose to new immortal human life. So let's go to our text and see what the historian Luke is telling us, and let's ponder it. Luke 24, I'm going to actually begin in the two sentences before that. Then they, the women, on that Friday, returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. So these women are depressed. They're, they're grieving. They have no hope. All they expect when they get there, and hopefully someone can move the stone for them, and they're going to anoint the body with more spices. They're just expecting as they do that more Sorrow. And then Luke tells us, they got there and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
Now that stone was caught, it was chiseled out into a big massive wheel so you could roll it and it takes several strong men to roll it to expose the opening in, for the cave to get in. And Matthew tells us that there were a couple guards, Roman guards, posted at the tomb. Okay. All right. Here, here's the fact. The tomb was empty. And Jesus' body was gone. If the tomb had not been empty, this is what I mean by historical fact, then 50 days later, when his disciples start proclaiming that he rose from the dead and the Jewish hierarchy hated what they were doing, all they had to do is go get the body and say, what are you talking about? The body wasn't there. And so all the scenarios that critics come up with throughout the centuries, well, someone bribed the Roman guards, and so they said, I'll take that money, and took the body somewhere. Okay, first of all, they're never going to risk their lives, and if you understood what it meant to be a Roman guard and what your job was, and you lose the body, you lose your life. Well, Jesus' disciples, they came and they stole the body and hid it somewhere else. Okay, then you have to believe that these guys who are in mass confusion, they're, they're fearful, they're hiding, are we next? And depressed, you have to believe that they said, we're going to do now in the next 24, 30 hours some brave, grave robbery with Roman soldiers posted. Or if you even just say, let's just say the, the disciples stole the body. What you would have to believe then is not only for the next year, but five years and ten and decades, that these guys who know Jesus did not rise from the dead because they stole the body. They went holding to their testimony of his resurrection in the face and in the experience of persecutions, jail time, whippings, and most of them ultimately being killed because they would not recant their testimony of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. That doesn't work. The tomb is empty. Let's go back to our text. These women are distressed. They're thinking, what in the heck is going on? And then verse 4. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. So they were afraid. They were afraid because they knew this was unusual. It's not like normal men. There's a supernatural something that is happening. And the angels implied that they should have known not to seek the living among the dead. And they go on, because Jesus kept telling them what's going to happen. Listen to the angels. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day, rise. So they say, think back. Remember Jesus' words. Like what? Like Luke 9, verse 22. 
And Jesus strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Or Matthew 16.21 From that time Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. The women, they remember Jesus' words. He did say that stuff. But as they're all journeying, ready to leave Galilee, and that long, months-long journey to Jerusalem, not just the women, but the men, They know Jesus often spoke in parables. He spoke in metaphors. So as they're journeying to Jerusalem, they're not taking these words literally. They had no category as they're journeying to Jerusalem. Hey, we're going there. And what's going to happen is Jesus is going to be arrested and he's going to be tortured to death. Okay, let's go. Oh, we're going to hang around for a couple of days, you know, because he didn't rise from the dead. This was not their paradigm in their journey. Even Jesus said it. But now, these women, after having watched Jesus get tortured to death, caked with spices and wrapped with mummy-like cloths, laid in the cave. And 36 hours later, they return. And the body's gone, and two angels scared the bejeebies out of them. And they say to them, He is risen. Now their eyes were opened. Luke says in verses 8 and 9, And they remembered His words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and the rest. Okay. But before they got back into town where they're all hiding out to tell them, Matthew says, Something else happened in between. And he says it this way. And so these women parted quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Hi. That's what he said. We don't talk greetings. Come on. Hi. He made me lose my place, Kathy, by laughing. And they came up and they took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. So we pick up in Luke's account. Now, it was Mary Magdalene. And Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. These are devastated men. And they were not impressed with the women's story. To them, it was hollow, empty talk. Literally, translated, silly talk. Babbling. And we would have all responded the same way. But these men responding that way, 
There's something unique about them because Jesus handpicked them out of hundreds of choices of disciples. He chose these 11. And they're the men who are going to lay the foundation of Christianity, of the church, through their eyewitness testimony and their teaching. And what do they do when the women bear witness of what Jesus was already telling them? They dismissed them as fools. But Peter, who had a really bad last couple days after running away from Caiaphas' courtyard in shame and tears, started to think. Jesus did say some very bizarre things recently. Like, I, Peter, who I knew I never would, would even deny knowing him. And it would coalesce with a cock crowing in the morning. He did rebuke me strongly when I said to him, I will never let you be killed. And he rebuked me for it. And he did get brutally killed. He did say, he used those words that he would rise from the dead. Is he talking literally? So you look at verse 12. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. Peter ran to the tomb after those women came back. But he wasn't the only person who ran to the tomb. The Apostle John lets us know from his own eyewitness account this. So Peter went out with the other disciple. That's how John refers to himself. And they were going toward the tomb, both of them running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there. But he did not go in. Then Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed. What they saw were the linen wrappings, like wrapping a body, like a mummy, with strips of cloth lying there. But Jesus' body was not in them. And first they know, if someone would have stolen the body they're not going to take the time to unwrap the grave clothes and take the naked body. They know Jesus' body must have passed through the grave clothes. They're just left there, wrapped around nothing. That's against physics. And then the face cloth, of course, neatly folded, was over the head, set down. And that shows them Jesus didn't just wake up. <laughs> well, I wasn't really dead. And unwrap himself. But he was resurrected. 
His physical body was transformed into an immortal human body that could pass through cloth. And of course, then over the next six weeks, Jesus will make appearance after appearance after appearance after appearance and sit down and teach and instruct and eat food with and drink with his apostles, many other disciples, men and women. He'll pass through doors and then he'll disappear as we read earlier today. He'll get charcoals going on a beach. He'll do another miracle of fish. And then they'll start to cook them. And he'll eat. And they'll talk, even though they're freaked out. And there's no way to explain historically how these men who were transformed from fearful, Depressed, confused men to bold witnesses who were ready to die for their testimony that the crucified Jesus was resurrected to immortal life. Only way to explain what happened to them was that they did sit with him. They did eat with him, and they did talk with this once dead Jesus. So that they explode into public proclamation. Like Peter began it all on the day of Pentecost. When there's thousands of fellow Jews throughout the temple courtyard and they get silenced and Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men, the Romans, the Gentiles. But God raised Him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for Him to be held by it. And we all here are eyewitnesses of this. In Jesus' resurrection, it confirms that He did come, as the Old Testament predicted, to give His life as a ransom price. As a substitutionary sacrifice to receive the wrath of God against all the sins of everyone who would come to Him. And a week after His resurrection, He he said to one of His apostles, Thomas, you've believed because you've seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so the Apostle Paul writes, and these words are addressed to every sinner on planet earth. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Yahweh, the one true God, Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved from your sin from the consequences of what your life 
justly brings, you will be delivered. And it's absolutely true that for any of us to be saved by Jesus, we must personally come to Him. We must personally love the gospel, the truth, culminating in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And we also know that that faith like that only happens by the spiritual work of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts. Now, having said that, none of our subjective feelings about Jesus make that testimony true. Does it make history true? I can believe that the moon is made of cheese. I'd be really sincere. It doesn't make it so. Jesus was either raised from the dead as they testify, or he was not. And Christ has risen, and faith in him is the only way for any of our personal salvation. Mary and the other women, they encountered Jesus. The apostles and many others hung out with Jesus and were taught by Jesus, and they ate food with Jesus over number of weeks. And the Apostle Paul, he sums up the very foundation of what Christianity is with these words. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Hebrew Scriptures, that He was <clears throat> buried, <coughs> and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom, as I write, are still alive, though some have fallen asleep in death. And then he appeared to his brother, James. And then he appeared to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So, I proclaim to you, Jesus is risen. He's risen truly, bodily, historically, actually. He has risen indeed. Let's pray. Father, thank you. As Paul writes it, you did not spare or hold back your eternal Son, but you gave him in the womb of Mary to become one of us in order to die for us. You delivered him up for us. And you conquered death through him for us forever. We thank you that you have made him our hope. And with the Apostle Paul, we say, come, meaning come back, 
Lord Jesus, you will. And all of us on this side of our own deaths, we look to this great triumph. For it's true. And you are good. And we thank you. And for this closing time on this Easter morning, be exalted in your sanctifying us, your people, our resurrected King. Amen. Please stand with me. And if you believe it, not yet, Chris, hold on. Say it loudly. You know your part. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen.